It seems to me that the city should be designed for the people and not for the automobile. This is Halifax, a charming little oceanside city on the east coast of Canada. Sorry, Vancouverites, Montreal is not east coast, and Toronto is definitely not east coast. When I moved to Halifax almost 15 years ago for university, I brought a bike with the intention of using it to commute. I wasn't a bike enthusiast or anything, just someone who saw what I thought was a very practical opportunity. Getting to my university was 30 minutes by foot, 20 minutes on a crowded bus, or a very easy 10-minute bike ride. But despite this commute being perfect for cycling on paper, I only actually did it by bike a handful of times. The reason was simple. Halifax had little to no dedicated bike infrastructure, and I didn't feel safe or comfortable sharing the road with cars, or illegally taking the sidewalk with pedestrians. I didn't even really know what bike infrastructure was at the time. I just knew that city biking, as I experienced it, wasn't for me. I had a similar experience in another smaller city, London, Ontario. Ever heard of it? In university. I would bike onto and through campus and take the multi-use paths along the river occasionally, but I wouldn't have even considered biking downtown. It just wasn't something I was aware of anyone doing. Urbanist ideas like cycling for transportation, public transit, density, and mixed-use development tend to get coded as big city things for big city lifestyles, but we think that's a big mistake. Nearly every urbanist concept or design that we talk about on this channel is also relevant in smaller cities. Halifax is a population of about 350,000 people in the built-up urban and suburban parts of the city. That makes it much smaller than Toronto, Montreal, and even Ottawa, the cities we've covered most on this channel. But my difficulties trying to bike in Halifax had nothing to do with the city's population or even density. Cycling was already practical, in theory. Every single one of my routine needs was available within practical cycling distance on the peninsula, the urban core of the city. What was lacking were streets that I felt safe and comfortable biking on to get to those destinations. Halifax has made improvements in the decades since I moved away, with some key protected bike lanes downtown, but the rest of the peninsula is still woefully underserved. If the city took this seriously, the peninsula could absolutely be a powerhouse of urban cycling like the Plateau and surrounding neighborhoods in Montreal. What's interesting about Halifax is that, cycling aside, it's already pretty strong in a lot of areas that urbanists emphasize. Halifax has one of the highest rates in Canada of people walking to work, and pretty high transit use for a city that doesn't have any urban rail system. The downtown core is relatively dense and very lively with high-quality pedestrian-oriented public spaces like the Waterfront, Grand Parade Square, the Halifax Citadel, Argyle Street, and the Public Gardens. Our footage comes from a trip over Thanksgiving when the city was quieter than normal, but in general these urban destinations are bustling with families, the city's big student population, and the large volumes of tourists that the city gets, especially in cruise ship season. The urbanism of Halifax has a lot to do with it being a relatively old city. The public gardens date to 1867. If they were born in 1967, they might have been half parking. Halifax's newer neighborhoods off the peninsula are correspondingly much more car-centric and less human scale, but that was a choice to drop pedestrian and transit-focused neighborhood design to fully embrace the automobile. It was not some inevitable property of being a small city, because the city was even smaller in population when it developed around its old tram lines. Fortunately, Halifax avoided some mistakes in its suburbanization, too. After opposition, the city abandoned its monstrous plan to demolish much of the historic downtown waterfront area to build Harbour Drive, a six-lane elevated highway like the Gardner Expressway in Toronto. And this morning we seek your opinions on this morning on whether you think we as citizens should fight the encroachment of the automobile on our lives, on our society, through expressways and interchanges that will slice up our city virtually and will, in the process, destroy many of our old historic buildings on the Halifax waterfront in particular. The overbuilt interchange constructed at the north entrance of downtown was eventually recognized as a mistake too, and they're tearing it down. Urban highways are an enormous quality of life subsidy to the suburbs, demolishing large parts of the central city in order to facilitate car traffic from far away. Harbor Drive was championed by a newly built downtown mall. Looking at you, Scotia Square. We're not saying the size of a city doesn't matter, only that bigger and smaller cities aren't fundamentally that different. Smaller cities can't support the same high-capacity metros, 
and far-reaching commuter rail networks that you see in bigger centers, but they can still offer good transit. Halifax's new bus lanes and planned ferry expansion are a good start, but urban rail transit could potentially be feasible too. European cities roughly as big as Halifax have trams and even light metro systems, and Halifax itself used to have trams when it was smaller. Kitchener-Waterloo got a 19-kilometer light rail line recently, and while that city has a bigger population, Halifax's relatively high transit use means that it actually has more transit riders than Kitchener. Halifax's geography, limited space on the peninsula with lots of bottlenecks and bodies of water, makes it extra important to invest in higher capacity, more space-efficient ways of getting people around, like walking, cycling, and public transit. On top of better transit, Halifax definitely isn't too small to implement safer street designs with strategies like raised crosswalks to prioritize pedestrians at crossings, narrower lanes to slow cars, or modal filtering to reduce car traffic. A kid shouldn't have to live in a mega metropolis to deserve to be able to walk or bike to school safely. While Halifax has a long way to go on traffic calming, on our recent trip we noticed some modal filtering as well as a ton of places with curb extensions, which feel like a major reclaiming of public space for pedestrians. Unfortunately, in some areas, the city's hands are tied. Halifax is legally unable to post speed limits below 50 kilometers an hour on its streets without special permission from the province. One real difference between smaller and bigger cities is density. All else being equal, smaller cities will naturally tend to be less dense because there's more incentive to use land efficiently in a major metropolis where millions of people and businesses want to live or do business. That's why you tend to get bigger skyscrapers in bigger cities. But skyscrapers and super high densities aren't actually needed for things like walkability or bike infrastructure. The Halifax Peninsula in particular is already dense enough that almost everyone is within a 10-minute bike ride of a grocery store. What's lacking isn't density so much as safe and comfortable bike infrastructure. And even in places where density is lacking, it doesn't have to be. Most North American cities, big and small, have spent decades using policies like zoning to discourage denser housing in pedestrian-focused stores. For example, Halifax's own master plan of 1945 identified a low density of population as a standard requirement for a desirable neighborhood and called for apartments to be segregated from single-family homes. Cities might consider no longer doing this? Credit to Halifax for its recent center plan that increases height limits on key corridors, legalizes secondary suites everywhere, and tries to set simpler and more predictable rules for development. But we'd obviously like to see them go further and also just legalize small apartments everywhere. According to one councillor, the goal of the center plan was still to put development where it makes sense, on busy corridors, while protecting the character of the lower-density residential neighborhoods. This feels a lot like the Toronto approach of concentrating development into hyper-dense clusters on traffic-choked arterials, while leaving quote-unquote established neighborhoods exempt from most types of housing. We have nothing against taller buildings themselves, but this unbalanced approach results in development patterns that are, honestly, weird, lopsided, and artificial. After having lived in Montreal, we think it's wild that four-story apartments aren't legal to build literally everywhere. Setting aside questions of how cities densify, it's clear that all of the economic, environmental, and health benefits of denser, more compact development patterns still apply to smaller cities, too. Halifax itself commissioned a study finding that concentrating more development in the central city could save $700 million by 2031. Road construction and maintenance, wastewater, fire and emergency, police. Most services are cheaper to provide to a less spread-out population. The study also found health and lifestyle benefits, more free time, more transportation options, more physical activity, and obviously decreased pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. We were going to end this video by talking about how urbanist ideas might be a tougher sell in smaller cities, if these places see more people visiting or moving from surrounding rural areas, where people don't have as much exposure to things like denser housing or public transit. This might still be true, but the evidence we looked into didn't actually support it in the case of Halifax. One poll found that Haligonians, yes, that's what people from Halifax are called, are actually very supportive of protected bike infrastructure, more so than in many bigger cities. And we were going to talk about Halifax's attempt at a transit-only corridor on Spring Garden Road this summer that was cancelled after just a few days because drivers kept driving on the street anyway, but that's been a major problem on Toronto's King Street Transit Priority Corridor too.
It goes to show that bigger and smaller cities aren't as different as we think. Thanks for watching through to the end of the video. Don't forget to bike and subscribe. And a special thanks to our supporters on Patreon.